Well, hey, good morning. It's great to see you this morning. What a great time of worship we've already had together. Hey, I'm curious, how many of you have ever been in some kind of uh, endurance sport? Maybe you've run a marathon. Anybody? All the marathon finishers. Yeah, you're going to raise it high. Uh, how about you who've run maybe a half marathon? Anybody? How about a 5K? Anybody? Okay. How about you've uh, you like won an eating contest? Like you... <laughs> you Busted out a burrito like nobody could believe it. Uh, moms, any moms? Okay, same, same thing. Um, endurance sport, right? Uh, an endurance sport takes a lot. It takes training. It takes, you know, it, it takes discipling. Uh, I mean, a discipline kind of thing all the time that you've got to prepare. You've got to keep on pressing on to, uh, to finish the race. Today we're going to talk about... Uh, an enduring faith. What makes for an enduring faith? Over the next three weeks, a really special time in the life of our church. I'm going to be coming at the entire church family, as I am now, uh, across our, all of our venues with three key messages I think will be historic in the life of our church. Uh, we're going to be walking through celebrating our 80th anniversary as a church. Isn't that amazing? Yes, we, we applaud that. Praise God for that. Um, it's been such an incredible run for 80 years and we're going to talk about over the next three weeks uh, that we are an enduring church. Okay. Today we'll look back at the past a little bit. Uh, next week we're a prevailing church and then we are an advancing church on the 20th. We're going to all find ourselves, uh, out front. I hope you'll come and join us after the services and we're going to be, uh, having lunch on the lawn together. So I hope you'll come and join us there. All right. Thank you. You guys can shut me down. All right, there we go. Um, and hey, here's what I want to do. I want to do. Uh, you can go ahead and grab your Bible. You can turn to uh, Hebrews 12. We're going to get there in just a moment. But before we do, um, I, I want you to know that that you know the 80 years that we have experienced as a people should not surprise any of us that we have prevailed for that many years. Now I say that, and immediately we think, well, not many churches survive 80 years, and they really don't. But the capital C church. And so we've been blessed, but at the capital C church, uh, we should not be surprised. It's still around after 2,000 years. When Jesus was asked, um, or when he asked his disciples, hey, who do you say I am? Peter, you know, the leader of the bunch often, or impetuous Peter, he jumped out there and said, well, you're, you're the Messiah. You're the Christ. You're the liberating king, is what he said. And Jesus then said, maybe you know this in Matthew 16, 18, he says this, I tell you, Peter, you are... Peter, you're Petros. That, that Petra is the word there, actually. You're, you're like, uh, you're a rock. Okay, that's your name. You're, you're rocky. But listen, on this rock, a different word, Petros is this word, foundational rock. I'm going to build my church. The foundation of the church was this proclamation that he made, this truth. Jesus is saying, I'm going to build the church on me and on the fact that I am the Messiah. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, check this out. This, there's this prevailing movement, this, this, this uh, group of people on the move, on the offensive, attacking the gates of hell. We're not sitting back casually. We are aggressively moving forward, dispelling the darkness, pushing back evil. And we are an enduring church today because that's what our founders determined. And throughout the years, we're standing now on the shoulders of those who've gone before us. So we thought it'd really be cool today for all of us to pause for a moment and to, to just reflect on our history. So I want you to watch this. Check, check out this video. In 1939, a conversation among friends on the steps of Gaston Avenue Baptist Church grew into a vision. First Baptist Church's larger-than-life pastor, Dr. George W. Truitt, gave their vision a larger-than-life push by adding his own thoughts. There ought to be a church in the Park Cities. Park Cities Baptist Church was born from this small group of Christians and chartered on October 26, 1939 in the University Park Town Hall. The church's first pastor was Dr. Alton Reed, and the first offering collected was for missions. Worship services were held in a house on Lover's Lane. By 1944, Park Cities Baptist Church had grown from 100 to 1,000 and the church family began raising money for its own building. Ten acres of farmland were later purchased on Northwest Highway to begin construction. When Dr. Herbert Howard became the pastor in 1948, 
he sensed immediately that God was at work in the hearts of church members. Ministry and mission flourished. As the sanctuary was completed in 1956, the church's outreach in the community increased, never wavering from its missional commitment to reach others for Christ. In 1964, Park Cities began broadcasting Sunday services on television. Dr. James Plites became pastor in 1978 and expanded the church's broadcast mission with the Thought Daily Devotional Moments on local television. In 2003, Park Cities Baptist began worship in Espanol, a Spanish-language congregation that has grown from five members to over 200 who worship weekly and are valued members of the Park Cities family of faith, taking part in all aspects of church life. In September 2010, Dr. Jeff Warren became the senior pastor, coming home to Park Cities after previously having served in other ministry capacities here. Through his leadership, Global Missions has expanded, with church members joining together to help start new churches and develop ministries around the world. Involvement in our local community has grown to working alongside over a dozen ministry partners that serve impoverished neighborhoods, foster racial reconciliation, and help a growing refugee community assimilate and experience genuine compassion in a new culture. Hundreds of Park City's members serve with these ministry partners every single week and give generously through the church to support their work. Since that first gathering in 1939, Park City's Baptist Church remains a mission-minded, multicultural, multi-generational family, powered by the same missional mindset that every gathering, every class, every prayer, and every song will guide every person who enters Park City's Baptist Church to follow Jesus every day. We say here at Park City's that we live life on purpose. And that really means that we're a church with a purpose, given by God, living it out on purpose. It starts with each of us in the church family by celebrating what God has done in our hearts, our lives, and here at our church and what He's going to do as we embrace the future together. May all we do in and through Park Cities, in the name of Jesus, continue God's story of grace for generations to come. Let's praise the Lord. Yeah, let's just praise Him for what He's done. Amen. What a joy it is uh, to serve with you all. So as noted, uh, Stacy and I have been here for a quarter of that time, collectively. About 20 years I've had the privilege of serving alongside uh, so many of you. Some of you just showed up recently. In fact, we've got new members who just joined this past week. No one could have seen in 1939... What would be happening today? I mean, clearly not in our culture, but nobody could have seen uh, what our church would become and, and all that is done over that period of time. Think about it. 1939, uh, Hitler's Germany was pressing against the border of Poland. 1939, the very year our church started, World War II began. Of course, we, became, we were neutral until 1941. The Manhattan Project started in 1939, which would ultimately produce uh, the atomic bomb. How about this? In 1939, The Wizard of Oz came out. But it didn't win the Academy Award. It was eclipsed by another film. Anybody? Gone with the Wind. That's right. Some of you young people, then, what? You know the film, right? You all know this movie. But incredible year. Ten cents a gallon for, uh, for gas. Yeah, wouldn't that be great today, right? You could buy a new car for $700. And not only that, but a new, a new house, the average cost of a new house, $3,800. Average wage then was $1,730. That year, if you're a sports enthusiast, um, Lou Gehrig gave his final farewell uh, speech after being diagnosed with ALS uh, from Yankee Stadium, his, his luckiest man alive speech. And uh, we saw, how about this, LaGuardia Airport in New York City opened that same year. No one could have seen closer to home what would happen when a, a group of people gathered at UP Elementary to say, that we ought to start a church. And then all that would happen in the days to come. Nobody could have seen Dr. Reed and that small group of believers. And I've read his kind of memoirs of his thoughts about coming here. By faith, they called this, this uh, young pastor to come be the pastor of this people to start this church. We were once a church plant. 
No one could have guessed the spiritual climate that, that would be, uh, we'd see in our day. Nobody would have guessed that a church, ultimately, that would find itself on the edge of town. I mean, there's a picture in that video. You could look past Northwest Highway, and it's like prairie land. No one could have guessed. You could drive for 30, 40 minutes and not be out of the city, if you will, as we move forward into the north or even the south. But nobody could have seen the spiritual climate that we would find ourselves in in this cultural moment. And I want to unpack that. We're going to get to the text here in a moment. But I want to, I want to do this because over the next few weeks, I want to talk about this a bit. There's four cultural waves where we find ourselves now in this cultural moment. The first is, we've talked about this recently, is a post-Christian culture. Now, now, we're not nearly where Europe is, but all signs are, all the bellwether signs are moving us towards this post-truth culture. Where, where uh, you know, we're seeing now with vast implications regarding human, human sexuality, ideological polarizations. We're seeing moral relativism, the focus on the autonomous self. We've talked a lot about this as the main and ruling authority in one's life. And, and it's, it's why we, we start to think, why does truth seem like hate towards people who don't want to receive the truth? Why has it been flipped that suddenly uh, the Christian message becomes this kind of twisted thing? And of course, all this leads to a secular world view. Secular meaning earthy, um, worldly. It means non-spiritual. It's what the writer of Ecclesiastes called life under the sun. The driving secular narrative we've talked about in recent days is basically you do you. That is the driving uh, message of the secular story. We also find ourselves in what David Kenneman has called digital Babylon. In his book, Faith for Exiles, he, he says, we are now living in exiles far from Jerusalem, far from a biblical worldview, if you will, in the predominant culture. And we find ourselves in digital, digital Babylon. Now, the disciple maker, we've talked a lot about this, parents, uh, educator of our children is so often whatever is in front of our screens. And we can hardly get off of our screens. And now algorithms and a surveillance capitalism kind of guides our thoughts and what we need and desire we think. 64% of young adults, you've heard all of this before, um, will, will leave the church at some point, having grown up in church. Now, uh, only 10% are, are called resilient disciples, uh, 18 to 29-year-olds. And praise God, I'm speaking to a whole bunch of them right here in front of me. High school students, we got college students here, because a lot of times we think, well, if everybody else is doing it, I'm doing it, right? Not us. Not us. We will continue to be faithful, and, and we see all of this as if that's not enough. Add to the mix of false gospel. Or I could say what really has, has driven us to this point is a work harder, get better, what's been described as a moralistic, therapeutic deism, which brings no hope to anyone who might turn to it. And I say all this because underneath what we're seeing in our cultural moment now, this undercurrent of anxiety, this polarization of ideologies is based on what you see there. And we find ourselves right in the middle of it. In that con those concentric circles, that's what's happening as we think about kind of a cultural commentary. But a lot of this is not new. Think about it. Humans are sinning. Uh, Satan is scheming. Okay, ideologies are warring. And many, by all signs, many are saying, and Western civilization is unraveling. Now, you're thinking, Jeff, this is not good news. Here's the good news. There's a growing sense, and this is part of what's happening in our culture today, that the Western, uh, ultimately now the secular story is not working. It's not working. And everybody got a hunch that something's wrong, and this is good news. Because we have the light that can dispel the darkness. I believe that a secular tide has come in over these past 80 years, but I'm believing that it's going out, and God's people are positioned to rise up and to proclaim the gospel as never before in our generation. And I'm praying like many of us, praying for revival. And it's going to start with each of us, which is why these messages are so critical in these days. That we unite ourselves around God's word together as one church. So what must we do? I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12, the writer bringing comfort and instruction to Christians under harsh persecution. 
not, not, not like what we're experiencing in our day, a very, I mean, losing their lives. Many were thinking about giving up, abandoning their faith. And so in Hebrews 11, he describes, many of you know this, that it, what enduring faith looks like. And he goes through a whole list of what enduring faith looks like. And what happens is we look at this, we call it the hall of faith, don't we? We look at it and we think they're superheroes. I mean, it's Abraham, you know, it's Isaac and Jacob, it's Moses. It's all of those. And we say they're just superheroes. And this is not the case. These are just people like you and me. And the reason that they, they're known now, we talk about them now, there's only one distinguishing factor. Faith. And it's enduring faith. And that's what I want to talk about today. If you're thinking about giving up, if you've struggled this week, if you're having a hard time in this season of your life, lots of questions. I want to challenge you. We endure because they did. We endure because Jesus did. We endure because we are the church. So look at this. First of all, we endure because they did. This passage, again, he hearkens back. Look at what he says in verse 1. Therefore, so in light of chapter 11, Since we are, look at this, are now surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight. So there's this image of of running a race, an enduring endurance race, and sin which so so clings clings to us so closely or so easily entangles us, shuts us down, slows us down. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now you see this image again of a race. The word is agon. In the Greek. It's where we get our word agony. Okay, so think, those of you who don't run, some of y'all made it like from watching the football game, from your seat to the fridge and back. You know, you're killing it. But for those of us who, who have actually been in some endurance race, and all of us have faced enduring moments, even now, we're walking through those. But this word agony, it's agony to press on, keep going. So have that in mind, this idea of a long race. The Christian life is not a sprint. It's a marathon. And, and, and I, want to, I want to encourage you today how you can have encouraging faith. So by faith, Abraham, he says back in, uh, in chapter 11, verse 17, by faith, he, he pressed on, not knowing what was before him. Listen, by faith, the people went before us. By faith, Dr. Reed and a small group of people uh, decided even then to start, where might we meet? Meeting in a house uh, that is on, on Lover's Lane. Over there, right where now Scotland Yard is, if you know where the baseball field is at Highland Park High School, right there. And then, then they could never have seen what would come, but they, they said, let's press on. And, and, and no one could have seen what would happen. By faith over time, he says, by faith, Moses, you know, led the people out of Israel. I think I'm Dr. Howard. By faith, and yes, along with a group of faithful lay people, uh, the church itself, not Dr. Howard or a pastor, but a group of people who said, let's do this. And so in 1950s, they had this audacious vision to go out away into the wilderness, out on the edge of town, essentially, and to say, let's go, let's do this. We look back and, and we know that uh, those who've gone before us, we, we, we look at them and we say, we can be faithful in our moment, in our time. And so then the writer, back to uh, chapter 11, he changes tone and he, he wants to encourage those who are facing persecution. And friends, we've got to raise up our young people, uh, our teenagers, to, to be able to, to press into a world that I believe is going to look very different than the world that many of us grew up in. In 10 years, 20 years, how do you live out your faith in a world that becomes more oppressive and and to to a large degree, I think, more persecution uh, for believers? And so here's what he says. He says, hey, some of them uh, suffered imprisonment. Some of them were chained. Some of them were flogged. And we're seeing this around the world, by the way. Uh, You can go on websites and see all that's happening where Christians are being martyred in our day. Many say more now than ever before across the world as the gospel's advancing in places that it never has before. Uh, And and so he says, hey, some were sawed in two. Some were killed by the sword. And his point is this. They're all commended for their faith, he says, but not all of them reached the promise. They never experienced the promise in their moment. And this is a good word for all of us in our time, in our moment And especially people, you know, like me, I mean, old people who need to pass on the gospel to the next generation. It's our time to be the example for them. But he says, look back at them. 
You can endure because they did. And then he says this. He says, they didn't receive the promise in part because their faith is fulfilled in you. It's like taking the baton and we press on. We may not experience all that we want according to our preferences, what we desire in our moment, he says, but we pass the gospel on to the next generation. And this is what he's calling us to do. We look at their lives and we realize what matters most. Think about this. You reflect on those who have, I mean, we saw pictures, right? A black and white picture of people who are no longer here. I mean, every time that I do a funeral, I go home thinking, my life is going to end. What will be, what will they say of me? And not not that it matters what anybody says of me, but what will be my legacy? What will be our moment? What will your life count for? How are you living your life even in these days? We endure because they did. We look at them. They're cheering us on as we run this race. Secondly, look at this. We endure because he did. And this is really the focus of it all. We endure because Jesus did. Look at verse 2. Looking to Jesus. And this word is to fixate on. Fixating our hearts and our lives on Him. It means to focus not on other things. It literally means to turn away from other, other things and focus on Him. We've talked a lot about that in recent days. The founder, the perfecter. The starter and the finisher. But he's saying the one who started it, but the one who finished it. He lived the perfect life for us. He died on the cross for our sin And he says, the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy, how about that? The joy set before him endured the cross. We can prevail like Jesus endure because we see what's happening beyond it all. We live with the end in sight. That's what Jesus did. Despising its shame. That's another way of saying not even thinking about the shame that one would take by going to the cross. The most shameful death anyone could have. He says, whatever, I'm going to go anyway and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, the place of authority, the place of victory. He's finished the race. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that, here's why, you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. See, enduring faith is fixated on Jesus. Think about this. If you've ever run a race, uh, there there are those who finish long before you. Like, you know, I've done some triathlons where the professionals are done. I mean, they're 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 doing, you know, they're they're like with the press talking. They're taking showers. I mean, they go to dinner and they come back. Right. Jesus has finished. He's done. He ran the race. He, he's taking a shower. He's, he's, had a, he's had a feast. He's sitting there. But watch this. He's watching us. He's saying, come on. Come on. I'm here at the finish line. Focus your hearts on him and run hard after him. He's cheering us on. We endure because he did. Look at this. Finally, we endure because we are the church. We endure because we're, the, we're, we're, we're his Because of who we are, whose we are. We are sons and daughters of the king established by his grace. And his church will prevail. But look at this in verse 4. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. He's saying, you're still alive. Not like others. But you're still here. So he says this, verse 5. And have you forgotten the exhortation that that addresses you as sons? And he draws from Proverbs 3. Where it says, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. So now watch this. It looks like, wait, he's talking about suffering. Now he's talking about discipline. He's saying, yes, you're suffering. The challenges that you have, even persecution. Yes, even living in this life, whatever you're going through now. He's using to make you stronger. He's using as training for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastises every son whom he receives. A loving father disciplines. If he doesn't love you, he's not going to discipline you, but he disciplines his children out of love. This is what he's saying. He goes on in verse 7 and beyond saying it's, it's for discipline that you must endure. Brothers and sisters, listen. If we're going to be a prevailing people, if you're going to endure in faith, If we're going to be the church he's called us to, particularly in this cultural moment, we must have enduring faith. Some of you here today are thinking about giving up. Some have given up. Don't give up. Whatever you're going through, don't give up. And here's what we here's what we see. The church, capital C Church, will prevail 
It, it, but, but listen, we're not promised the next 80 years. Very few churches, last, very few organizations last 80 years. We're not promised the next 80 years. The capital church is going to prevail. People think the church is, you know, we've talked about this recently, terminally ill. It's on its deathbed. Well, we're seeing that the church is in decline. But watch this. The, the church is in decline in the global west. The white church is in decline globally. Now the center of Christian, the Christian movement has shifted. Watch this. was formerly in Europe, the United States. Now it has shifted to the global south. One in four Christians on the planet are in Africa right now. And many of us met a lot of them this past summer as we're partnering with them. And I say all this because we can decide whether we're going to be a part of this movement or not in the days to come. But we've got to have enduring faith. We, I mean, think about it. You look at the church. The church is addressed even in the book of Revelation. Oh, for seven. None of them are still around. Not really. Now, did from those churches go forth others? You bet they did. But God is calling us to be faithful right here, right now. To live with enduring faith. So what will we do? I want to close this time with certain challenges. First, we will remove every hindrance. Apply this personally. It's, we see it in verse, verse 1. You must remove every weight, all excess. Rid ourselves of non-core issues. We've got to get rid of any, anything that we're doing, is, is how to apply this corporately, any traditions that are not passing the gospel on to the next generation. Traditions are good if they're doing that. If not, they've got to go. And so we, we, we focus in, we, 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 we need to be effective in this day, in this moment. We remove every weight that's pulling us down. That's what he says. You need to do that in your personal life. Some of you need to focus in and stop wasting your life on things that do not matter. You look at your schedule and all that you're doing. Some of us parents, frankly, I'm speaking to here. Stop doing certain things and, and, and so that the gospel, the church activities around Christ are being squeezed out of your life. you got to get rid of those excess things. Look at this. We will embrace suffering as training. Verses 4 through 6 we talked about. Our hardships, uh, growing opposition are not without purpose. God is using our suffering to discipline us, to shape us. See, Jesus went to the cross willingly. But we go through suffering because we do not obey God willingly. That's a lot of what we are faced with. And we are a fallen, broken people. Jesus suffered willingly, voluntarily. And we must do the same. We will press in to whatever God is calling us to. Watch this next one. We will pursue holiness over happiness. That's his goal in our lives. The writer says God is disciplining us as beloved sons and disciplining us as beloved sons and daughters. Referring to earthly fathers, look at what he says in verse 10. He says, for they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. The purpose of your life, friends, if we can get our minds around this, it's not happiness. For me to stand up here and say, you do you. Yeah, how's that going for us, right? No, no, no. You do Christ. Be like Jesus. That's where joy comes from. That's where it comes from. Sacrificial love. It's a love and grace that comes to all people in our lives. And then finally, we will never give up. The writer goes on to finish out this, this portion. See, some of you are thinking about giving up. But he says, listen, don't give up. Look at verse 11. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. And later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. That word trained is the word uh, gymnazo in the Greek. It's where we get our word gymnasium. It's a working out. As you're working out, your muscles are being broken down. It's not a lot of fun. But they're built, built up again. See, the father is a trainer. He's a coach and he's guiding us. We will train our young. That's what we will do. We will run this race together. He goes on to say, we're not going to be like Esau in verse 16, who traded away God's lifelong gift to satisfy a short-term appetite. And he's referencing sexual sin, by the way. But that's true about all sin. We will, and let me say this, we will remain calm. We will love our persecutors. 
We will be the non-anxious presence that this world is looking for. We will be invincible. What does this enduring faith look like? It looks like a people, a person, going to help and care for the poor. It looks like a person walking across the street to meet a neighbor's need. It looks like a church that comes together and says, let's go to the most difficult places in our city and make a difference. This past week, we got word from Jack Lowe Elementary. I know there's a group, David Harper's class was over there yesterday. We're over there all the time. We're mentoring, guiding, leading, helping this, church, this, this school, this be, becoming a church, a school in Jack Lowe Elementary. And God is doing a great thing. We got word this week. They were just a few years ago. They were designated as needs improvement, the lowest rating you can get in DISD. And this past week, Sandra Barrios celebrated with us that the school received the National Blue Ribbon School Award. Yes, praise the Lord. Praise Him. And I want you to hear this. It has been a profoundly deep day full of tears from the principal she wrote us. To top it all off, I was in training. I just came to work to hear the announcement. Our kids went wild. Thank you, PCBC. This would not be possible without you. I have tears in my eyes thinking about everything you have done to walk alongside us. You have been our saviors, she says, in so many ways. Now, we know who the savior is. She knows who the savior is. God bless you. Thank you for all the blessings. And please relay this message, which I'm doing now, that without PCBC, every single person, none of this would be possible. You were with us when no one believed in us and no one wanted to touch us or be associated with us. You came to us. And I know it was God's work. I thank God every morning and every night for PCBC. I honestly feel like the luckiest person alive. I love PCBC, she says. I often wonder, does, does it matter that we're here? Like if we stopped all that we're doing and just, would anybody know? Would the city be different? There's a group of people at Jack Lowe Elementary. How about Cornerstone, West Dallas? How about, how about on the border of Texas in the valley? There are people all over who would say, if you guys stop doing what? Now watch this. This doesn't answer the question, what would happen if we stopped gathering? What would happen if we stopped being the church? And yes, gathering And then launching into ministry. Does it matter that we're here? It matters, friends. It matters. What does enduring faith look like? Looks like serving others. It it looks like uh, coming alongside others. Pushing us towards holiness. Getting into groups together. Getting into connect groups. Or in a men's small group. Or women's group. In a crew. Junior high or high school. College uh, gatherings at the hill. It looks like embracing people who don't look like us. It looks like grace. It looks like Jesus. The entire world set its attention on Dallas this past week. And you all know where I'm heading with this. I was with a group of pastors, both of them John's pastor, at the beginning of this trial, praying with him. We're just praying for justice, praying for truth to prevail, praying for everyone involved. No one could have seen what Brent Jean did after the sentencing. You saw it unless you've been on another planet. He said this. He looks at the woman who killed his beloved brother. And he says, I forgive you. I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you because I know that's exactly what both of them would want. And the best is to give your life to Christ. I think giving your life to Christ would be the best thing. And what both of them would want you to do. And then you saw this. As the world watched, Brant asked if he could go and hug Geiger, and he did. And then Judge Tammy Kemp came down and spoke to her as well. He grabbed a Bible, she grabbed a Bible that was 
in her chambers, this incredible godly judge seeking to just, just be the presence of Christ. She said, you can have mine. You're going to need this. I have three or four more at home. You just, and then she said that you need just a tiny mustard seed of faith. And she pointed to John three sixteen, which everyone kind of heard. And she said, you start with this. And she read John three sixteen to her. And then she said this. Whatever she said, whatever Geiger said to her, she said, it's not because I'm good. It's because I believe in Christ. You haven't done so much that you can't be forgiven. You did something bad in a moment in time. What you do now matters, is what she said. What you do now matters. And friends, listen, wherever you've been, whatever is coming your way in life, what matters is what you do now. You've done nothing. That God cannot forgive you of. And how about this? Those who you need to forgive. Shock your own world. Shock people in your family. You take the first step. You be the one to say. Preemptive grace. Is what Jesus has shown me. I will forgive. Don't wait on the other person. Whom do you need to forgive? How about this? What have they done to you? That's enduring faith. When we live out the gospel in front of people around us, one person at a time, you may not make international news, but you can change the course of your family. You can change the course of relationships. See, in this storyline, we're all Amber Geiger. All of us caught dead guilty for our sin. All of us are murderers. And Jesus Christ, the judge of the living and the dead, took off his robe, his royal robe. He stepped down to where we are. And he died on the cross, having paid the price for our sin. And he's waiting. He's waiting on you to finish the race, to endure, and to hug you as you approach him. The Bible says we'll see him face to face. And in that moment, we will be changed. We will become just like him because there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He finished the race. And he says, come on, come on, don't give up, don't give up. We endure because they did. We endure because he did. We endure because we are the church of Jesus Christ. Don't give up, friends. Don't give up. Let's pray together. Lord, we praise you that you've run the race for us. You have extended your grace to us in Jesus We thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. Friend, listen, if you have never received Christ, don't let this moment go by without saying yes to him now. By faith, receive his grace. Believe that he has taken it all upon himself for you. Give him your life. And for all of us, Lord, we give our lives to you. What else would we do? Where else would we go? We thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. We celebrate the victory that we have. Lord, bless your church. Bless each person here that this week we would live with enduring faith. We would not give up. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. Amen.